Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another year of GDC, another game connection. Uh, See so yeah, some familiar faces, some new faces. So uh, my name is Greg Short. I'm the CEO and co-founder of EDAR. We are the largest specialty research firm for video games in the world. We play every game that comes out and catalog it into a taxonomy of over 15,000 pieces of metadata. We have over 100 million pieces of metadata we have collected over the last seven or eight years. So uh, we know everything that you're doing. It's kind of cool. But today, we're talking about virality through originality, which if you look at your, uh, at your uh, schedule, you'll find that I decided to change the topic. So I thought that was very original of me. But in talking with, uh, with Steve, uh, I thought this was a little bit better, better, better play to go. So let's dive into it. Unfortunately for us, the gamers that we all knew are gone. The couchers are not as full as they used to be. The market has dramatically changed to Chris's point about, you know, if you don't keep up, if you don't adapt, the market will move on. That's exactly what's been happening to the video game industry over the last couple of years. What's actually happened uh, is that the gamers of today are now total entertainment consumers. Gamers are playing on their cell phones, they're playing on their tablets, they're playing on Facebook, they're, you know, playing things on the train, on the plane, they're watching video on demand. These people just consume media when they want it, where they want it, in the time that they have to spare to accomplish it. We have people who consume, are dedicated in their mindset, they're two minute consumers. I consume while I'm waiting for the train. That's the only time they play games each day. So it's a completely different market than we used to, to deal with, with this core 18 to 34 year old male demographic where we're like, we know exactly what they want, we know exactly what message to push to them. Now we have this incredibly broad demographic that's growing not only in terms of markets locally, but also internationally, China, India, you know, other emerging territories. We're at Latin America, huge growing territory right now. So, you know, when we think about gamers, as I said, you know, we used to have these core gamers, you know, these pro league gamers. You're going to hear a little bit today about the people who are keeping the core industry alive with esports. But we were also starting to get a lot more like grandmas and grandpas. There are in retirement homes now Wii bowling leagues, Wii fit leagues, you know, where they get out and they're all doing their yoga together on their Wii fit boards. It's crazy, but it's actually part of the lifestyle. Um, and when we think about parents and children, you know, there's a whole new dynamic of edutainment. Uh, type things. I have an 18 month old little girl. I'm trying to keep her away from the iPad as long as I can, but she's like gravitated to technology. She wants to push the buttons. She wants to move things. And, and it's, it's becoming very natural for us to, to incorporate that into our lifestyle. What's really interesting, in uh, a study run by the ESA last year, women who are over 18 actually represent more of the game playing population than boys under the age of 17. So it's actually, you know, you think like teenage kids doing all these things, but the reality is that it, it's not exactly what people have thought it is. And people are consuming media uh, across this whole demographic. As a note, the deck will be available. You don't have to take pictures. I will make sure you will get a copy if you would like one. So what's really interesting, uh, Nielsen did this really interesting study about media consumption and just where are people consuming media now? And the answer is really simple. They're consuming it everywhere. But they're still doing a lot of traditional television. There's still a lot of stuff happening on that big screen. And even though we're seeing a rising number of people using smartphones, using tablets, computers are still a huge install base. We're seeing PC gaming continuing to have a strong resurgence with Steambox and other things that are coming out. Uh, the reality is that what we're actually still seeing is a lot of traditional HD console gaming. There's some overlap, I think, here between like DVD players and video game consoles, because they're kind of the same thing. But, uh, but it's very interesting just to see how diverse people are consuming media now across all of these landscapes. It's not just computer and TV like it was a few years ago. From an install base perspective, uh, you know, when you look at how many people are actually playing on various devices, it's pretty amazing how far the iPad has come in a few years. And for a lot of you who work here in the mobile space, uh, it won't be surprising how huge the iPhone is in terms of its worldwide install base. There's a lot of people there. Now, you can probably take a few off there for the one you know, dropped in the toilet or smashed, you know, whatever. But uh, there's still a lot of iPhones out there. This doesn't even include Android, right? So you take Android devices on there as well. Mobile is clearly just this very, very large, a very dynamic install base. 
What's interesting is when you look at the change between this slide last year. So last year, that's how many iPads and iPhones were out there. In one year, that's the amount of growth that we've had. So it's been pretty, it's been pretty big. So where are the games coming out? You know, it, so this is looking at uh, the traditional gaming market, right? Including digital games on the console. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is a bit of a, a retreat in terms of the number of games coming out. We're getting longer in the cycle. It's getting a little bit late. We've been sort of refocusing back on core brands, doing games that are a little bit safer bets. Uh, but when you actually add in what's going on in mobile, it's a completely different world. And, and it's not in terms of magnitudes of, you know, a few, you know, if we go back here, now we're going from like 1,500 traditional games to 43,000 games in one year coming out. So with that many games coming out all the time, the point of being original, the point of actually standing out in that crowd becomes pretty challenging and pretty important to consider. So let's think about that a little bit. Now, when we look at games like Bejeweled Blitz, who has played Bejeweled Blitz? It's got to be a fair, fairly large portion of people. Uh, coffee's got to kick in here more, people. Not seeing enough enthusiasm. So, so Bejeweled Blitz is a very interesting game. My wife plays this game a lot. And she's finally, after like three and a half years of playing this game, purchased her first microtransaction. So I guess my credit card's in for a bit of a run. But what's really interesting is, when you look at how many games are actually coming out in that puzzle genre space, like 61% of the audience are saying that they're actively playing match matching puzzle games on iOS of some kind. And 15% out of the top 5,000 ranked iOS games, 15% of all games that have come out have been matching puzzle games. So Bejeweled Blitz is one of those 15%. How many people do you think are actually going in and they're trying you know, another puzzle game and they're like, oh, this is okay, you know, maybe they like it because it's you know, Smurf Berries or something else? It's quite a decent number. The problem is this. Our consumer audience in mobile games is maturing incredibly quickly. And by maturing, what I mean is that they're defining in their heads, this is my best experience of a matching puzzle game. And I call it Bejeweled Blitz. So every time they go and play that next game, they're asking themselves a question. Well, is this better than the one that I currently consider my, my best in class game? And if it's not, they exit. And the majority of games are exited within the first 10 minutes, over 80% of games. People download them, play them, yeah, not what I want. And we're seeing that get faster and faster because as people start spending money, they start to think a little bit more about like, well, do I want to spend money on this game? Is this good enough to make an investment? And so as people play more of these games, and what we've really seen with the tablet market that's been quite interesting has been that when people play tablets, they think of it as I'm playing a game. When people play f games on their iPhones, they think I'm killing time. It's a very different mindset between tablet gamers and iPhone gamers. And as a result of, of the tablet gamers and people who are both tablet and phone gamers, it's bleeding back. So the people who are going to their tablet to play dedicated gaming experiences, becoming more mature, becoming more trained in terms of what they expect, that knowledge and that expectation of quality is bleeding back into how they purchase on iPhone. And as a result of that, we're seeing it being harder and harder and harder to break out and be original. But it's something that we have to figure out because there are so many games coming out. And it's, it's actually kind of scary on that previous chart that I showed you with the 43,000. About 25% of those come out in December. So it's still very backlogged where people are like, we're giving gifts, we know there's going to be a lot of new games out there, we're going to try and push a lot of games out at Christmas, take advantage of that. Some people are holding back content now, waiting for when new devices get released. They're waiting to hear an iPhone 6 is coming out, and the week of that, they're going to try and shovel their games out in the channel. There's very interesting things in terms of timing that people are trying to do to try and get ahead. Well, what's kind of scary from a traditional business is this is traditional market, right? This is physical sales uh, in North America. And we've seen that sales are getting more and more front-loaded, right? So it used to be that you had a slightly more elongated curve, uh, but now you're, you're doing, you know, 50, 60% of your sales in the first month. This was through 2011. We're still um, working through the 2012 data. But in 2012, the data is looking like it could be as high as 70% of your lifetime sales on a physical game are occurring in month one. So that's, of course, impacting pricing. That's impacting when we're marketing, how we're marketing uh, in great ways. But what it's meaning is consumers are getting very specific. They're saying, I want this game. I want it now. I'm willing to buy it now. And then maybe they wait for it to come out cheap way, way down the line. But there seems to be a big gap in between. 
What's interesting on the mobile side of the business is just the new types of, of consumers that we have to deal with. And at EDA, we did a study last year called our Emerging Markets Report. And in this report, we kind of went through and, and came up with a little bit of our segmentation in terms of where people pay and how, pay, how they pay. This is how much they spend on a monthly basis. This isn't their lifetime. You know, the average sort of killer whale is spending a pretty significant amount of money each month. There was um, some articles about Clash of Clans. You know, people spent so far like $7,000, $8,000 in some cases on one game building up their little armies to throw at people. And it gets into some interesting challenges with refunds and things, but we won't get on that today. But the, the point here is, when you're creating your game, you know, you really want to be going after dolphins or higher. You know, the minnows represent a lot of people. They represent a lot of people, but they pay very small amounts each month. Uh, so if you can get a game that has, you know, 20 million people playing it, then the minnow is a great base. But if you're wanting to actually get a game that's going to monetize well, you're going to be in that dolphin and whale category. But what's interesting with dolphins and whales is they still have a cycle. The average whale cycles out of a game in about 45 days. A dolphin takes about 60 days. So unless your game is incredibly sticky, you still only have 60 days to achieve lifetime value out of a lot of these people. And then they're moving on to the, their next game. Uh, killer whales, on average, will, will try 20 to 30 games a month. So they're constantly looking for the new game that's going to be the, the one that they want to switch to. When they find it, they invest big, and then they'll play it for you know, a little bit of time. They might play two or three games at the same time. So what's happening, of course, as a result of this change that we're seeing in types of consumers, in the challenges in the traditional business market, uh, in the opportunities that digital ecosystems present is that now we're starting to see new business models emerge. And this is what has to happen. You know, the next generation of, of consoles and PC and mobile gaming is not going to be just about, you know, well, is it 99 cents? Is it freemium? How well can I optimize that microtransaction? It's going to be a completely different business models. Episodic content, time-based content, uh, trading card content, you know, being able to share content with each other. So The Walking Dead just won lots of awards, episodic series-based game, very interesting. Uh, did anyone here play Walking Dead on an episodic basis where they downloaded in the episodes as they came along? There's a few people here. It was a very interesting approach. Of course, you know, as a research firm, as soon as it won a few awards, we got like 900 calls. We want to make episodic games. The reality is most of them will fail. Why? Because if you don't have a brand big enough, the average curve on the churn cliff episode to episode is 20%. So people play the game the first time, you're going to lose 20% because they're like, ah, oh, it wasn't as good as I thought. Then the second episode comes out and they're like, oh, I don't know if that was worth the five bucks that I paid, so you lose another 20%. Before you know it, you've got no install base, right? So if, unless you've got a huge brand to tie it into, episodic content is still not really working from a market perspective yet. But it'll get there because sooner or later, you know, our consumers are going to get a little bit more educated and they're going to see that playing episodic games is just kind of like watching their episodic TV shows. But there's a lot of work we have to do as game developers to create better tools to be able to move content out that fast. It's really, really hard. If you think you, know, you need to create two to three hour experience of content and you've got seven days to do it, that's not going to work, right? So you're going to have to build it up, release it over time. But these new business models and strategies come with a lot of risk to the point that we, we do have to take that risk to advance our craft. Getting the money to take, go after those challenges can be a little bit harder. Uh, FIFA is doing some really, really interesting stuff. Uh, for those people who didn't uh, realize that there's actually a game within the game, uh, you can play FIFA on the one side, but you can also be a team manager and have this whole ultimate team mini game on the, on the inside. They make an enormous amount of money, particularly in Europe, with people buying and selling players and trading cards and trying to build the ultimate team. And they have whole leagues that your team can play simulated matches and it's, uh, it's also very interesting when you start to create this, this micro-economy within your game, how you can use that to incentivize pre-purchasing, pre-ordering, upselling. So it's not just about here's a bunch of content, it's also about how do I leverage that content to drive sales of the master product, right? Thinking about the whole ecosystem of that. And then of course we have the whole you know, clash of clans, this whole core, mid-core type game that kicks eye and kabam are really going after really hard right now and Supercell have done incredibly well. You know, hitting into these RPG strategy, you know, core action genres that's, uh, but coming up with a way that you can experience those genres in a slightly light touch format. You don't have to play an hour of the game at a time to be able to have a powerful experience. The challenge that we all face is really what's 
just about to tip in, right? Steambox is alluding to it already, uh, you know, on life, didn't really accomplish it. But with Sony's acquisition of Gaikai, uh, we're going to very, very soon be at a point where any game you ever want to play is available on any device, anytime, anywhere. Unlimited catalog, unlimited storefront. And we have that to a degree right now on Apple and anyone who's, and Android, but anyone who's tried to use their storefronts to find stuff knows that discovery is terrible. Right? We all bemoan it. So, so the question's going to very quickly become, you know, in this sea of games, great games, you know, Mario is still an awesome game, you know, as, late, as many years that it's gone. How are we going to get people to want to play these games? So step one is to think about, well, why do they play games? So this came from our, our last study about why do people play mobile and tablet games? And it's, it's very interesting how the consumer is shifting in terms of why they're playing games. It used to be we play games because, well, I want to play a game. I, I worked all day. I didn't have a chance to play any games all day. I've got my crave. I come home get my six pack open, put my feet up on the couch, and I start shooting people, right? Um, that's not the case anymore. People are actually now getting the opportunity to play games throughout the day in micro content pieces. So when they get home, they're like, well, you know, I'm not so craving. I can wait an hour, spend some time with the wife, and then go do my gaming fix. So it's very different. This has also been sort of diluted and, and challenged a little bit by the amount of hybridization that's going on in games. You know, we're starting to see these huge crossovers between shooter RPG strategy type stuff and uh, simulation RPG type stuff. It's, it's very interesting because people are trying to be unique as they're trying to create new content and try to be different. They're just borrowing from everybody else's genres and trying to create something that's you know, not what happens when you take every single color and let a kid do finger painting. You just get this brown mess. So they're trying to still create ones that have identity, have color. So how do you do that? Well, traditionally, we went above the line, right? We, uh, we bought media. We bought eyeballs. And we, we did that through direct media. We did that through in-store channel presence, uh, print media, online ads. And you know that's throwing money at the problem directly. And that's still a huge part of the traditional marketing business, but far less so in mobile. It's very hard on mobile to go and spend you know, $2 million or $3 million on a campaign you know, when you don't know how, how you're going to get that return on investment. It's particularly hard because of the pricing models, right? It's a lot of people you have to get to convert at a dollar or even at a lifetime value of $5 to, to get that return on investment back on a $3 million bet. So above the line is going to kind of work us a little bit. But then the next one we get into is really below the line, which is where we're starting to talk a, a bit about what's going on today experiential events, very targeted channel experiences, uh, earned media activities, you know, doing things that get people talking about you in the press, get you on the blogs, you know, have people start doing community stuff. But what we really, really need to fill the funnel, and we're going to talk about this in very specifics in a moment here, is virality. You have to have people talking about your games. And it's not just about empowering people to talk about the game. The game itself has to be the momentum that drives that. It has to be so original, so unique, so interesting that people can't help themselves. They have to go and talk to their friends about it. That's, you know, the content does drive it. The marketing helps activate it and, and get that seed, that first sort of push of the avalanche going. But then it's up to the game to continue to push itself. You, it's too expensive otherwise to keep trying to convince people that your game is good. If the game's not good, the game's not good. You can, not much you can do. Don't make bad games. That, that's, a, that's a quote for this entire segment. <laughs> Don't make bad games. So, so let's talk about HD games. I want to talk a little bit about really putting this into some quantifiable numbers for you. So these are illustrative purposes only. But let's imagine, let's imagine that there's 50 million people out there who have Xboxes and PlayStation 3s. And I'm going to run a traditional campaign. And I think with my traditional campaign, I'm going to be able to get 20% of those people, very optimistic, to convert. That's 10 million people who are going to buy my game. And, when the, and because my game is a box product, they're going to pay me their $36, 100% monetization of those people. I just made $360 million. That's great. The 36 comes from what you actually get from a $60 product if you're a publisher. But it's very different on the mobile and social side of things. Because in this spectrum, let's imagine there's 200 million people out there. So there's a lot more people. 
but the conversion rate is lower, it's 5%. And if I'm on a free to play game, maybe only 10% of that 5% will actually give me some money. So now I've only got a million people who are gonna actually give me money, and maybe I'll get $10 out of them, so my lifetime value would be $10 million. So even though I had 200 million people out there, uh, I get a lot less. And that's assuming we're spending about the same amount, say $3 million on traditional media. So we end up with this pretty significant problem, which is this gap, right? Because even though there are 50 million or 200 million people out there, and you're trying to hit this targeted number of people that, you're, that you want to monetize to make some money, the amount of people that you can actually get to see your game and purchase your game on average from these will never fill the funnel big enough to actually get you to the point of profitability at the bottom, at the bottom of the barrel. You know, we all know, if anyone here, has anyone here been spending money on Facebook ads and Google ads over the last year or two? A few of you? Has it gone up in price? Yes? Hopefully it'll come down in price as the VC money dries up a little bit and there's less war chests. But the, the truth is that there's this huge gap. And so how do you fill that gap? Well, the only way you can fill that gap is by people advertising your game for you creating cool content, doing interesting things, talking about you, blogosphering it, hopefully not doing bad things that cause negative press, but in some cases, all press is good press. Uh, this, this huge gap is the big problem that we're facing. You know, Steve alluded to it earlier, our money's not going as far as it used to go, but the reality is, it's not that it's not going as far as it used to go, it's just that it's not getting people to come in. And, and this gap is, is a problem because people are consuming their games in so many different areas that it's, you really got to push them to get them to want to convert and to want to activate. So key takeaway from this point is uh, you cannot spend enough money to make profit if you're just trying to buy your ads. This is uh, from the super data uh, data set and this is actually what they consider like good games in terms of conversion and ARPU. So in our model, we were talking $10 ARPUs and things like that. The reality is ARPUs are about half that. Um, and the actual conversion rates in terms of, of you know, spending decent amounts of money in the first month or, or making multiple purchases in a single month are pretty low. So uh, interestingly, females are one of the strongest, st strongest demographics when it comes to purchasing. Still, that's on a global basis. So when we think about, OK, well, I have to make my game cool and unique. How am I going to do that? The reality is it's pretty hard, and part of the reason that it's hard is because our gaming genres are already defined for us, for the most part. When I make a shooter, what am I going to put in there? Oh, I better have a knife. I might have no bullets, and I still need to kill things, so I better have a knife. And I better have a pistol, because you know, I can't give them the best guns right away. We've got to start off with just a little pistol. Well, if I don't have a pistol, I better have a machine gun, and a bazooka, and a sniper rifle, and a shotgun. Okay, there you go, I'm a shooter, right? If you don't have this general assortment of games, you know, weapons, people are going in there, they're continuing to look, like, when am I gonna get my shotgun? Yeah. So, as soon as you go beyond uh, the, defin the definitions of our genres, you very quickly go into other genres. It's very quick to go from shooter to action, or from action to racing. It's, you know, and and the, the industry, as from a consumer standpoint, as soon as they hit that, they're like, well, maybe I don't, align with that type of game as much anymore. Of course, we've had uniqueness. We've had people do cool things. Portal, portal gun, uh, the gravity gun in Half-Life 2. You all remember the first time we were able to pick things up and throw stuff at people. That was really cool. Um, chainsaw gun in Gears of War, taking things to new levels. So it is possible to create new weapons. Unreal Tournament did it. I mean, there's been great new weapons that have come in, but at the end of the day, you know, you'll find just about every shooter has at least that standard assortment of weapons in it ever since sort of the, the doom days. So I've, I found it very interesting. I went and kind of looked at sort of key art uh, in terms of, right, well, let's assume that I make an interesting game and I, now, now I've got to give it to my marketing firm and hope that they make it interesting for me. And then I pulled up all this key art, I'm like, wow, they all look the same. That's cool. I wonder if they were all done by the same agency. I don't know. Um, great key art, looks really interesting, but to a consumer on the shelf, how, do you, how does any of that call out to you and say, play something new, play something different? You know, maybe, maybe the Far Cry one a little bit, or Battlefield has some, at least some vehicles in it. Crisis has a bow, so if you're into archery, that's cool. But the, the, the reality is that our, our agencies are not really doing a very good job overall in terms of pushing 
uniqueness. You know, some games that have done a little bit better are Portal 2. Very clear what you're going to be doing in Portal. You will be jumping from blue things to red things. Bioshock 2, you will have a big chainsaw drill thing on your arm. Uh, and of course, Borderlands 2 had very interesting Kiara. I don't know if as much Borderlands 2 expressed what it was doing, but it's certainly a different box, right? Uh, and Borderlands, you know, obviously played on Borderlands 1. So it is still possible to do interesting key art. You just have to think about what are you trying to do. Bioshock 2 is trying to really set and maintain this ongoing, very dark tone, right? This kind of slightly scary tone. Portal 2 just wanted fun, just jump around. So it is possible to be unique in your key art. You just have to think about it. And then, of course, it's important that you take that further onto your retail. So at EDAR, we have this service called Retail Track. We go into all the retailers in North America. We take pictures of every single advertisement that goes on every week. Um, and so you can see, like, you know, Borderlands 2, this real cool claptrap, you know, standy, shipper. Um, sorry, Borderlands 2 did that. Portal 2, you know, they kept the theme going there very clearly. Jump, jump, jump. Uh, and Bioshock had this nice one. And of course, in their key art, they also included uh, quite well here the, uh, all of the pre-order incentives that you got with it, making sure you understood the value of pre-ordering. So where are we going to go? This really sort of, you know, tying it in at, at, at the end here. Hopefully you're... I'm keeping people awake. Um, over the next few years, we're in, for, we're in for a ride. You know, it's been a very interesting last two, three years. We've seen, you know, our game companies have had a lot of shrinkage in terms of their capital value. We've seen, obviously, our layoffs, but it's not, you know, we start, hopefully, I think, in many cases, it's been great. They've all gone on to create awesome mobile games in many instances. But now we're coming into sort of phase two. You know, where are things going to go? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is mobile is going to keep growing. It is going to continue to explode, and there are enormous opportunities for you all in these emerging territories, China, Latin America, India. Uh, and yes, there's piracy, and there's copycatting, and there's duplication. You just have to assume that that is the case. It's been, it's been that way on the web forever. You, know, you create one cool website, and before you know it, tomorrow someone else has the same website. Uh, you have to think about you know, how are you going to get that maximum value out of your customer quickly and why is your game going to be, going to be unique uh, and original and how are you going to make sure that your strategy in terms of marketing and PR and momentum is going to get enough people into your game fast enough that the clones don't really have a chance to bleed you. So you have to, you have to be thinking, how are we going to win? You have to go in knowing you're going to be copycatted. How, how are you going to have a marketing campaign and a PR campaign and a hook and a media strategy that's going to get enough people to create a lodestone effect that they're going to drive all their friends into, into your game before the copycats bleed you? If you, don't go, if you go out there with a, well, we're just going to put version one out, we're going to iterate for a while, and eventually we'll get enough people to come to you, which was the old way that mobile games were made, you will be out, outpaced by people who are just waiting to take cool original concepts and steal them and put them in their game. So you've got to be thinking more aggressively than that. Secondly, next-gen hardware is coming, right? So PlayStation 4, the Unity announcement that came out, it's really exciting to a lot of independent developers. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going to change in our ecosystem. We're going to see a lot of new business models, a lot of new content sharing capabilities, a lot of new social-enabled gameplay. It's going to be very exciting. Obviously, you know, the industry is hoping that this is going to drive some new financial growth in the business on the top line. Uh, hopefully it will. We will see. But... There's always a but. Uh, we're going to want to see longer shelf life, and that's going to mean longer campaigns. If you're creating a game and that game's out there forever, your game's out there forever. So how are you building a new type of campaign that's going to keep interest around that long term? How are you maximizing your brand? How does that fit into your overall strategy? Which comes into brand cycle management. Did another talk on this once upon a time. If you want that deck, I can send it to you. The short sweet of it is brands have a lifespan. They're like vegetables, right? You grow them in the garden and they grow and they grow and they eventually get to the point where you gotta harvest a crop. When you're building portfolios of games on the traditional side of the business, you need to be thinking about one-offs, three, three skew sort of brands, and then perpetual brands. And you should be trying to create a mix of those if you actually have the money and the capability to do so. Uh, it's very interesting when you look at the music and rhythm industry that we went through, and we had Dance Dance Revolution and all these dancing games that are really, really cool. And then we had like the rock band era, and guess what's still selling just as well as it used to? In fact, better in some cases with just dance. Dance. Dance is still selling. So the music and rhythm industry isn't dead. We just had this little bump of a fad in between. So you've got to be looking at your brands and thinking about how you're going to manage those brands in order to get maximum value out of your overall portfolio. 
But most importantly, you have to be chasing USP. You have to be chasing uniqueness. You have to be thinking about what are you doing, not just in terms of your content of your game, not just in terms of your marketing and PR, but also in terms of your community management, your social strategy, your game-to-game -game SQL strategy, your cross-game integrations, your cross-media, transmedia integrations. Everything has to be around uniqueness because with the amount of content that is going to be out there, there's over you know, 250,000 games in mobile now. There's still 30,000 traditional HD games that are all going to come back into the market with this new cloud technology. How are you going to stand out? How is your, your investment of time and money going to actually equate to success? It's still really hard to be successful in our business unless you've got something that's really unique.